there are very few people in the world that I have wanted to talk to for 30 years. Today's guest is one of them. It's the most documented UFO encounter and abduction, I believe, in the world. And I've invited Travis Walton to come on and share his story with me. Travis, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, nice to be here. So uh, just for those that maybe don't know you, um, I, I thought that uh, we could go through your story and then I could ask some questions. I told you before I hit record that you're somebody that I've wanted to speak with for 30 years now. I saw the, the Hollywood movie of your story 30 years ago. I was 11 years old. I went into the movie theater. I saw it and it was the first time that I thought, Maybe, maybe there's something else out there, um, something more intelligent than us, something that has the ability to travel uh, around the world and around the, the galaxy. And so I, I appreciate you coming on. Um, let, let's, let's start from the beginning, uh, just in case people don't know. You were in, I believe, Arizona. You were on a logging job uh, when this happened. Uh, so tell, tell us your story, please. Well, in the movie, there's uh, five of us out there uh, simplifying the script. There was actually seven of us. So, you know, it was a big woods crew working out there, put in a long, hard day. And uh, we were, you know, uh, looking at winter weather approaching. So we were trying to get the contract finished and putting in a long day. So we worked right up till dark. And uh, as we were leaving, I noticed a glow coming through the trees ahead. and uh, I, I, I'm not sure who had noticed it first, you know, different, different people just kind of started looking and wondering. Uh, and then it was, what's that, you know? Uh, but there was, you know, in, uh, the contract area, there was not supposed to be any, you know, anybody out there really. Uh, it was deer hunting season, but other than that, uh, it, um, that's what I was thinking that maybe some deer hunters are camped up there on the hill. Uh, maybe lights coming through a tent or something because the trees were still thick in that area. Uh, when we got past that uh, thicket, there it was hovering there in the clearing. It was um, quite a shock. Everybody um, was uh, just immediately, you know, wasn't any doubt about it was this wasn't a, a a glowing dot in the distance. Uh, uh, I think it was Alan yelled out, it's a flying saucer or, or something like that. And uh, I thought it would just be gone real quick. You know, that's the way it is normally, you know, you see a deer or in wildlife and you call the attention of the other crewmen to it. And before they can even turn around and look, it's gone. So. I just thought this thing would be gone in a flash. And and so on impulse, I threw open the door and started towards it, which was kind of a little bit showing off, but uh, very kind of foolish thinking, kind of kind of duplicating the scene of, of chasing a bear. <laughs> we, a bear ran across the road and I jumped out and acted like I was chasing it. It, it wasn't running for me, it was running from the truck, but... Uh, um, in this case, uh, the um, the other crewmen were yelling at me, get back in the truck and get away from there. But I was just mesmerized by the sight. I was just stunned looking up at it. And, and uh, it, the sound was really, um, it's hard to describe it because it was something you not only heard, but felt at the same time. It's kind of a vibration that went through everything. But um, it suddenly got louder and, and started to move, started to uh, take off or something. I don't know. But, you know, the, the increase in volume is what scared me. I jumped for cover. The nearest thing was this log, um, some, you know, logging debris laying there. And uh, in order to get by, I ended up, I had to go down and forward a little bit. So when I uh, responded, you know, the guys were yelling at me, get in the truck, go, 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 you know, swearing at me to get, go, get out of there. 
uh, I didn't need to be told I wanted to run away, but I was kind of torn between my, my little refuge there behind the, the log and running back. But I stood up to run away and something hit me. It was just a stunning, um, if you ever been hit by something really hard, you didn't see it coming. That was how I would describe it. I can't say that I, I saw the, the blast of light. I just was instantly unconscious with the, uh, crew said it threw me through the air 15 or 20 feet and uh it was so violent that um they were um uh, screaming he's dead you know and screaming at the the boss to take off and get get him out of there get uh, take off for safety and uh you know he he knew that the same thing you know there was no there was no rescuing me if if i was killed <laughs> no sense getting the whole crew killed so um, they took off. Now in the movie, um, there's a point where they stop. Mike says, "Look, we left him there. You know, we can't just leave him there. We got, we got to uh, see if he's hurt, if we can help him." And in the movie, nobody wanted to go back. So Mike just said, "Well, if you uh, don't want to go with us." anybody who doesn't want to go back and just wait here beside the road and uh we'll go go see see what's up with travis but nobody volunteered to get out of the truck of course <laughs> uh, in the movie they all volunteered to get out of the truck and mike went back alone but that i, I didn't see the point in that you know i guess it was so they could accuse him of the murder but actually um the suspicion of murder from the sheriff's department was more directed at Alan Dallas, not, not Mike. Mike and I were friends. I didn't know all of the guys all that well, but uh, I'd gotten in a fight with Alan that morning and he had had a few scrapes with the law. So he was a natural suspect. Um, can, can I, can I interrupt you and ask a couple yeah. of questions? Okay. So the, the reason that the sheriff believes that you've been killed is because you, you then go af after this beam of light, this energy hits you, you go missing for a certain number of days, correct? Yeah. And, and you know, they, they went to get help. And, and uh, initially, uh, they told the law enforcement, you know, we think it killed him. You know, uh, they were trying to explain why they would just leave, leave me. And, you know, it was a reasonable <laughs> assumption. As a matter of fact, might might have been the case that, you know, I had to be revived. That that was later my theory that uh, it wasn't an intentional abduction. It was that um, if they had just left my body laying there, uh, I would have been uh, a, a kill a, de a death and so they were the only ones in a position to uh fix that okay and i think that's why i was taken aboard but as far as the sheriff was concerned he immediately becomes suspicious you know well one of our crewmen is missing we we think he's dead he goes dead oh, okay <laughs> and naturally that's the way law enforcement's um trained to think so uh so unlike in the movie where they don't go back out that night they did go back out that night the sheriff his second command i think a deputy or two that uh, took the men out there and made a search and uh in the movie they made a um, an issue of did you find the spot where it happened and but they were sure of that because when uh, they took off. Uh, Mike had spun out the tires and sort of dug a, a track in the in the road that made no. There's no reason that would be there except um, fleeing the the danger, you know. So, um, oh well. So so um, they so they they think that you're you're dead. The sheriff is thinking that you're crew has either killed you or or left you out there people are out looking 
um, and then you end up being gone for for several days. Um, at, as you pulled up on this area where it where it opened up, was was the entire craft visible to you, or just a, a part of it, or was it just the lights coming through the trees? Well, once we got where uh, we could see the whole thing, we could it, it was in, in, not obstructed by any trees or, or anything. We could see the entire object. Um, later, there was a scientific examination of the area that was kind of interesting. That uh, the presence of that craft may have affected the uh, growth of the trees there. In what way? That also that also plays into the theory about what what were these beings doing there? Why would they be there? You know. Uh, the theory that they were laying for us and wanted to catch catch some logger. I, I don't know about that one. But um, years later, I discovered that um, um, the Mogollon Rim area right there uh, has the highest frequency of lightning strikes of any place in the continental United States. Uh, the second highest, uh, Florida's highest, but that's Florida Everglades, that's that's over water. So I found out that when lightning hits the ground, it creates crystals called fulgurite. This is all new to me, but uh, fulgurite uh, cannot be created. Uh, uh, it takes millions of volts and millions of degrees of temperature. And uh, is also, of course, a product of the minerals in the ground that the that the lightning bolt hits and so i had a theory that maybe they were there uh harvesting a fulgur i i can't think of any other reason they would be there uh i certainly don't think of myself as unique or special or especially chosen to be taken uh i uh, not like those kind of theories i mean it, it sounds like you were the one that jumped out of the truck, and so you became the one that they had access to. But you, you even have you've said that uh, later in life you thought that maybe they had physically harmed you, your your health, maybe radiation or 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 something. Where in, instead of taking you and experimenting on you, that they were actually trying to repair you. Uh, yeah. Or yeah. Heal you. That was that was my theory, you know, that, that in order for this not to be uh, recorded or announced as uh, a, a fatal attack by uh, aliens, that that they uh, and and of course they were partially responsible, uh, perhaps. Now, if a if a lightning strike had hit that craft, and there was a secondary discharge. So it wasn't it wasn't actually a beam being fired at me. It was just some kind of a, a reaction that when I stood up, I closed the distance, and the spark jumped, and it was fatal, uh, or potentially fatal. So that's my theory that uh, they were just fixing, making up for my foolish uh, mistake of getting too close. Okay, and then. Um... Do you do you have any memory of being brought onto the craft, or you, in, in the movie it it portrays it as you waking up and you're already in there? Yeah, yeah. The, the crew did not see me taken aboard or beamed up or anything. People say stuff like that because I was hit with a, a blast of energy, which they said was looked like a foot wide laser or beam of energy that hit me and threw me back uh, now whether that was something lifting me up and, and putting me to a safer distance uh, I don't know about that theory but uh, you know when it when it hit me it was uh, very powerful now the medical uh, test I, w I was taken to doctor immediately afterwards did not um, detect any sort of burns on my clothing or on my skin Okay. Yeah, I was. Uh... There was some unusual readings on the uh, brain scans. Um, in order to, you know, they, it was creating such a hysteria that uh, the uh, 
doctor put me in for these tests. Now, this was the same machine that Muhammad Ali was tested on when he developed neurological problems. So uh, they put me in there to do uh, EEG and uh, um, EM, what do what they call it? Uh, magnetic resonance in an MRI. An MRI. Um, yeah. And, uh, and because of the panic, uh, Dr. Candell put me in there under a, a, an assumed name. So the technician was not projecting what he hoped or expected to find or anything. He just uh, made a comment in the report, which I still have a copy of, uh, an anomalous um, uh, said, uh, bisynchronous wave alternating traveling from front to back. Don't know what that means. But I had uh, another test uh, a few years later and it, that effect was gone. So I'm thinking that perhaps there was some sign of an injury there that wasn't quite repaired. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So then uh, you, so the, the media is now starting to gather, they're hearing stories of an abduction or a murder uh, unbeknownst, unbeknownst to you, all of this chaos is going on. How many, how many days were you missing? It was five days and six hours. Five days. During that time, you know, there was some ex extreme pressure on the crew uh, under suspicion of murder. And, you know, I mean, to the point where uh, John said he's walking down the street and had people yelling out the window, murderer, you know, it was... Uh, and my brother's, uh, you know, what what'd you do to my my brother? Kind of a thing it was a very um, uh, threatening, menacing sort of uh, demands to know what what they did to me, you know. So the searchers that uh, searched during that five days um, were looking for a body and uh, signs of blood or something like that you know, uh, a murder that would occur without the craft or anything, just something that happened with the crew. In the movie, you know, uh, Alan drops a tree that nearly hits me and uh, I give him a dirty look and that was pretty realistic that that really happened. Okay. Once you're on the craft and, and you you come to your, your senses, uh, at that point, do you feel any bodily harm or, or injury? Yeah, when when I woke up, I felt horribly injured, and uh, I didn't just come to real clearly. It was real um, indistinct. The main, the first sensation was just pain, my head and chest, and uh, it was dimly lit in there. There was a light above me, but even looking in that direction was painful. I could make up the forms around me of people that I thought were doctors. I knew I was on a raised surface because I was close to the light and the ceiling, but uh, it was, it was when my vision cleared, I could see that it was these creatures, these alien beings standing over me. And in, in the movie fire in the sky, did they do uh, a good job portraying what they look like or no, they they did they did not. I don't think they even attempted to duplicate the description that I provided. Um, when I was given a copy of the script, that whole abduction sequence was not in it. I guess they thought I was going to uh, object to the to the changes that they had made, which were considerable. What so what what did the beings look like? Well, uh, they were small, uh, short, you know, maybe four feet tall, but huge heads, hairless, and uh, very large eyes. I felt their their gaze was, you know, unbearable. It would seem like they were looking right through me. Okay, and and at, at this point. Um... Are you are you scared? Are you trying to get away or are you? Oh, I'm terrified. I'm yelling, uh, you know, and asking questions, screaming. 
uh, what are you, what is this, and that sort of thing. But they, they didn't attempt to speak or make a sound to me. They were, uh, but in hindsight, I'm thinking uh, that that may have been because they don't speak out their mouth like we do. That if they are telepathic, like so many people say, that why would they need to talk if they can uh, be in complete communication uh, tele telepathically? But to me, the, the non-response and the um, lack of expression in their face was extremely threatening to me. But that lack of expression goes hand in hand with the idea that if they're telepathic, facial expressions are some kind of a primitive, obsolete thing that they wouldn't have any longer, wouldn't be, have any purpose. Yeah, that, that actually makes sense. Um, two, two things that I've wanted to know is uh, about how big was the craft, number one, and then number two, this, this place where you wake up. Do you believe that was inside the craft or that you had been taken somewhere else? Well, it could have been either one since I didn't see the, 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 tra um, the, the change. The craft, um, you know, filled the clearing, but it wasn't huge. But inside, um, it was very cramped. The ceiling was very low. It was very small. And adding to the cramped, claustrophobic feeling was that I, I felt like I couldn't catch my breath, like I was uh, short of um, oxygen or something. Um, it could be that that could be a difference in the atmosphere they provide for themselves. This is speculation. Or, or it could be that uh, uh, something, uh, an effect of my injury, not being able to breathe to get enough air. Yeah, if you had bruised lungs or, or something. Um, yeah, it seemed very humid, but uh, I was uh, felt like I was suffocating, which added to the panic feeling. Yeah, uh, so I was, I was rethinking through the way that the movie uh, portrays their interaction with you. It, it looks like they're about to do experiments on you, um, that they're being somewhat barbaric but then last night as i was driving preparing my thoughts for today i was thinking if you looked into any surgical theater today and someone was cut open or on a ventilator what it, it would all look very barbaric because of the ability to remove pain and put somebody to sleep and so um how long from the interaction until it dawned on you that perhaps maybe they were trying to heal you versus investigate you. Well, you know, um, my immediate reaction was these are invading monsters and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, the longer I thought about it is why would they return me um, to a place I could get help? Um, they could have just left me back where they found me but you know i probably would have froze to death before i could make it to town on foot so to me that that made it seem like um they weren't as uh hostile as i had thought and as time went on i kept uh anxiously checking myself for m medical anomalies you know that you know could there be some sort of a, uh, after effects from being exposed to them because you know uh, Kenny one of the crewmen he was in the in the front seat next to me when I left the door open uh, he was in direct um, line of sight to the craft and he's developed uh, skin cancer on his right forearm so you know that could be a coincidence but um could have been some kind of radiation there because uh, researchers did find reason to think that there was uh, high radiation there for a while. Okay, okay. So you're you're gone for five days, six hours. Um, how do you how do you get back to town? How do you get in communication with your family? Uh, let, let's let's go that direction for a minute. 
Well, uh, <clears throat> when I woke up, uh, the night I was returned, it was just cold air. I woke up real quickly. I was totally conscious. I, I recognized that I was lying on some pavement, a road, and, but there was a light above me and I looked to see where the light was coming from. When I turned my head in that direction, a light went off and all I could see was a disc shaped object in the dark, just by moonlight or starlight or whatever. And it, it shot straight up into the sky immediately. But I had full memory of what I'd been through the shock, the horror, all that was driving me. And I could, I recognized this piece of road. I could see uh, the town of Heber down below. This was the town nearest where it happened. And um, I understand a, a perfect place to return somebody if they didn't want to be seen doing it because of the location of Heber in these steep canyons. Um, but I ran down into the town and banged on the first lighted building that uh, that I found. Um, it was uh, some kind of steam or smoke coming out of the chimney, but uh, nobody came. And maybe they heard me and were just afraid of who's, who's screaming like a maniac out there. But I ran on down across the second bridge and I found a row of telephone booths. I went in, tried to make a call, and it was out of order, which just drove my panic even higher. I went into the middle one, and it worked. Um, I made a collect call to my my home phone. Now, skeptics said, oh, Travis was never at that place at all. He was hiding out in such and such a place. They made up a variety of stories. but. The operator who took the collect call, kind of probably illegally, but fortunately um, notified the sheriff. And they sent a couple of deputies over there immediately, but they were unable to get there in the middle of the night quicker than my family uh, who came to get me. Were you, when, when, when you were returned, um... I'm trying to remember it, it. It seemed did the movie portray you as being naked, or were you clothed? Well, I was clothed. Okay. Um, naked might be a metaphor for the feeling of uh, stripped ego or, uh, or or that sort of thing, but uh, no, uh, that that was uh, a kind of a Hollywood type flourish. Oh, there was some worse stuff that was uh, cut out. <laughs> Travis uh, coming back into town naked, encountering a couple in the car and getting it on and screaming at them. They're screaming and I'm screaming. They, that was not used in the film, fortunately. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. So you, you get back in uh, to town. Um, I, I, would, I would have to imagine if I went through this that I would have PTSD, anxiety, looking over my shoulder that I'm going to be taken again. Did you, did you experience any of that? Oh yeah, very badly. And also I didn't trust anybody. And, and uh, the family kind of reacted that way because the, of the law enforcement's immediate um, reaction was, um, you know, suspicion of murder and all that, you know? So I was in no condition. I was pretty, pretty messed up. And uh, my brother knew that I, I couldn't endure that kind of uh, treatment if I had been taken in and interrogated. The most important thing was to get me medical tests. And he had encountered a number of scientists and people who had, uh, at the site during the search, um, saying, you know, if he's ever returned, get in touch with us and we know what to do and, you know, the kind of tests that need to be done. And that's very fortunate that that's what happened. Uh, I was taken to Phoenix and immediately put into, uh, uh, had a medical examination with a number of doctors and psychiatrists and, uh, 
and then um, the the, um, the hospitalization for brainwave uh, scans and x-rays and whatnot okay when uh when did the lie detector tests uh start happening with you and and all the other men that were involved and were, were they forced or voluntary it was totally voluntary the men were feeling pressure about murder and you know pressure from law enforcement and threats from my bro uh, family you know did you do something to travis um uh, so they said, we'll take any test you want. Give us sodium pentothal, hypnosis, uh, lie detector, whatever. Well, the Arizona Department of Public Safety had a polygraph examiner that came and tested the men, and they all passed. Um, but my test immediately also included uh, drug tests because that was important. Uh, there was a big theory that, oh, this didn't really happen. These guys were out there in the woods getting high and they hallucinated this whole thing. There was no craft, no aliens, no nothing. But um, there was not a trace of any drug in blood or urine samples that were put through the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's drug screen. Okay. And I, I remember in the movie uh, that there that, that uh so many people had passed or not passed but the lie detector test had determined that they were telling the truth did did that free any of them uh, up with the you know the the pressure that came from feeling yeah, like that they were made murdered? it a, a lot better you know of course uh my brothers knew that i hadn't been murdered and and uh and of course the um Department of Public Safety, state police uh, knew the reliability of those tests. And, you know, there, it's not 100% perfect. It is not used as proof in court, but uh, I mean, it's still used as the CIA and FBI use it to screen their own people. But uh, um, to have that many people, you know, right down the line passing um, is, is, possibility of like zero that there could be any kind of an error in the testing you know i've um, uh, eventually uh wound up passing five different tests uh, but uh, that's not enough for some people if you had seven people saying that they had witnessed a murder um that would probably be considered proof without the lie detectors but to have uh six people seven people passing tests uh in regard to this with lie detectors was suddenly still well we need to keep questioning and whatnot to me you know the idea that oh that's that's just so out, out there that there could be something else in this universe I don't know, if you have any concept of how big the universe is it's 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 not whether or not there's anything else out there it's <laughs> you know even if uh, earth is some kind of a an anomaly one in a million still there's millions of other earth like planets um it, the numbers are just uh most people just cannot understand that the number of you look at the night sky and this great band of sky uh, stars across the sky is the Milky Way. That's our galaxy. But so many of these other points of light in the, uh, up there in the distance are actually entire galaxies like our Milky Way. And this um, Webb telescope that they recently launched has a, a, the ability to see farther in more detail, more greater magnification than ever, ever before. They pointed it at the most empty spot in the sky that they could and found hundreds of galaxies, galaxies, entire Milky Ways, so to speak, to give you an idea. So the idea that with all those billions of trillions upon trillions of systems that there wouldn't be another Earth is absurd. The only question that anybody has that has any legitimacy is it would take too long to get here or 
they never find us or whatever, you know, they go come up with those kind of uh, reasons. But to say it's impossible is <laughs> to coin a phrase, uh, small minded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a big place. The other thing um, just in the last year that I've thought about um, is, you know, we, we assume, okay, if, if, you know, there was like a, a creator they could, that, that creator could create as much as it wants, right? If there wasn't a creator and the universe put itself together and evolution and, and all of that, even other beings or living life uh, forms, it doesn't mean that they would go through the same evolution or transition that human beings went through. M maybe they didn't go through a combustion engine. Maybe they went through a uh, zero point energy uh evolution or you know uh I, I think we assume that everybody would go through the same chronological order of technology going um that that we did at at the same time um you know it, even if uh a civilization was ten thousand or a million years more advanced than us look look how much advancement has happened from like the 1800s to 2023, computers, lasers, medical, I mean, almost all of the big jumps in humanity have been in the last 200 years. Yeah. So here we have a few hundred years and we've come this far. And we know based on the age of these star systems, what they can calculate, that they could be thousands or hundreds of millions of times older than us. And how far are we going to be in a couple of thousand years, let alone a million? So to place limitations on what they're capable of um, in terms of uh, travel is um, pretty arrogant. You know, it goes along with uh, the pronouncement that Lord Kelvin made way back when they had... a. Uh, invented the trains he says human beings will never be able to travel faster than 60 miles per hour because if they did all the air would be sucked out of the conveyance and they would suffocate and die now this is uh, lord kelvin this is the, the kelvin temperature scale was named after him but you know a lot of there's a lot of arrogance in thinking that we're the end all and it's just like um you know we're we're some kind of special thing but, you know, you have a good point that uh, are these other life forms going to be like us? You know, we've only been here, you know, just in thousands. We measure our, the age of humanity in thousands. The planet was dominated by dinosaurs for literally hundreds of millions of years. Millions of years. It was all dinosaurs. Something came along, killed the dinosaurs, gave the opportunity for humans to be here. Now, you people say, well, why couldn't it, why would it have to anything look like a human? Two arms, two legs, a head on top. Well, logically, what else is going to build something to travel in? I mean, you're not going to have a giant cockroach build a, a spacecraft. You're not going to have a big giant worm build a spacecraft. The, the ability to manipulate matter with two hands two legs it very very likely is going to be basically what we call humanoid two arms two legs a head on top other than that you know i always used to laugh at science fiction oh how come the aliens always look like a man in a suit you know <laughs> but maybe that isn't so far off that uh, you think about it what else can build something to travel outside of the planet that you come from yeah. You know, going, going back to your, uh, communicating, uh, w when you were in the, the craft, the, the alien forms, not communicating, uh, just, just in the last 30 days, Apple has released these virtual technology goggles. And I, I'm now seeing people in the mall and other things, and they have, it almost looks like a big scuba goggle on and a cord that comes down and these people, they're sitting at the table. None of them are talking to each other. They're all in their own little world. Um, I also see my my teenage son. Uh, you know, they may be in the same room, 
but they don't talk and they just text to each other. Like, so oh, I'm, yeah. I'm already I've seeing this. Type I've, of got, I've got 16 grandchildren and I'm trying to connect with them. I'm trying to show them books that I'd like for them to read. But if it doesn't come to them electronically, I thought one of my grandsons was, had one of those uh, wearing those things uh, the other day and he's in another world, <clears throat> virtual world. Yeah, he, he is. He is. Uh, well, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your story. Um, I've, I have been fascinated by it, like I said, for, for 30 years. Uh, since, since that event happened and, and being returned, have you felt like you've had any connection or communication with these beings, or was that the end of it? Well, I used to have a theory, and I called it the anthill theory, you know, that uh, if um, you're walking by an ant hill, would you stop, pause, and say, you know, I think I'll have a conversation with that ant right there. I thought the, the, the hubris, the arrogance of humans assuming that the aliens want anything to do with us is, is not, not on, on spot. I think it's the other way around. You know, um, our government has something called the Utah Data Center. It's recording every electronic transmission on the face of the earth right now. And if mere humans can gather that much information, certainly a civilization millions of years ahead of us can do even better. Maybe it's all in their head. <laughs> uh, so if you saw one when you're eight years old and they, you see one again as an adult, they know it's you. And that's just my theory, but um, so many of the sightings are on the edge of proof all the time. They're right there, but not quite enough to upset the balance. Um, people say, well, the United States government has all this technology. Why won't they just share it with us? Uh, wouldn't it be great if we had free energy tomorrow? No, if we had free energy tomorrow, it would lead to it. Uh, a gigantic cataclysm, uh, you know, all the economies would collapse, wars would break out everywhere. Um, especially knowing human nature, uh, I'm sure the aliens watching us are looking inside, shaking their heads, you know, what a bunch of savages. At any one time, we've got a hundred different wars going on. You know, we like to, think in positive terms and think about our accomplishments and the better better side of humans. But I think we could be doing a heck of a lot better if we're going to impress them to the point where they want to make open contact. But on the edge of our perceptions, they're there just kind of like, hello. I think they would be capable of visiting, doing everything they're doing here and remain completely undetected. Just my theory. But with their level of technology, I think sightings are intentional and the witnesses are probably chosen. I think that's pretty outlandish. I used to think that was kind of egocentric to think that way, that they had any connection to me, that it was just kind of an accident. I think that when, when you, they, that very, very little things, very few things that people see are accidental, that, that it's intentional and they were allowed to see it. Um, to keep nudging us in the direction of we're not all there is. There's something better that we could become. Yeah. Well, I, uh, it's interesting you brought up the NSA Utah data collection building because I live 20 minutes from it and yeah. I see the military helicopters every couple hours, they're running flight patterns over that building to make sure that nothing is coming near it. It's sucking up uh, water from Utah Lake to cool the system and then push oh, yeah. it back in. And yeah. Millions of gallons of water just to cool this computer. Yeah. But um, yeah, when I told people about that, I, I said, look it up. <laughs> you know, it's not in the news every day. They don't talk about the Utah data center, but it's a gigantic storage of data. And my understanding is it's a pretty big building and you can't, you can't get anywhere near it. They've got police there every night 
They've got helicopters going back and forth every couple of hours. But my understanding, Travis, is that half the building is underground. So this huge building that I can see with my eye, most of it is is under the earth anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> Well, uh, safer in case of attack, you know, and it's sad that they have to think of it on those terms. But that's another thing. People say, well, why doesn't the government just throw up in the books and tell us everything they have? If they recovered any uh, crashed craft, well, why don't they just show it to us? And, you know, I, I explain, you know, in my view that the, it's for our own good that they don't do that. Not just that there could be a collapse of economic collapse or, you know, switch to free energy or that kind of thing. But we have countries on this planet that are, are mortal enemies who'd love to destroy us. And uh, as long as they have to guess what kind of technology we might have come into possession of, I think that provides us a, a measure of safety that, uh, would be gone if we just opened the books and said, here's what we got. Gee, share what you got. <laughs> They're not going to give us what they have. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, thank you for coming on. I know it took us a couple months to line up our schedules and I appreciate you coming on and allowing someone who's been curious about your life for 30 years to pick your brain for 30 minutes or more. Um, if, if people want to learn more or stay in contact is TravisWalton.com, the best place that I should yeah, send them? That would be the place. You know, I have a book uh, uh, called Fire in the Sky, uh, named after the movie, sort of, you know, and uh, that's available. There's also a couple of really good uh, documentaries out there. One of them is called Travis. I would never name something after myself, but that's a 90 minute documentary, very thorough. And another one called Paranormal Witness. It was an episode of uh, of a TV series, but uh, very exceptional quality and production values in both of them. Um, interviewing a lot of people that haven't been interviewed by anybody else anywhere. So that's more information, but um, I'm still interested in digging into uh, the mysteries and solving more things. And in the future, maybe I can... Uh, uh, share what I've discovered. Yeah, that, that would be great. Thank you very much for coming on. I'll put that link down below and I, I appreciate you sharing your story with us today. Thank you. It's been interesting. A good interview. Thanks. Thank you.